Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina. I am the hostess of today's uh, explorative talks. I would like to welcome you all uh, to today's uh, talks with the theme movement. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Alvina and Christian for uh, this lovely introduction. And uh, today we will have a calm discussion, hopefully with uh, new ideas coming up in an interdisciplinary way with uh, uh, explorers that came from different uh, fields of study, from different parts of the world. So hopefully it's going to be uh, something that's never been done before. <laughs> um, we will start with just a small introduction of uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, so I can say, my name is Christina Neofidou. I work at the Karolinska Institute here in Sweden. I am a PhD student in molecular neurodevelopment. And uh, maybe we can start with Akko, uh, introducing herself. Certainly. Thank you, Christina, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, my name is Aku Kwame. I'm a technical officer with the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, uh, based at WHO in Geneva. My area of work is health systems governance, and so I'm interested in complexity science and systems thinking as it applies to uh, health systems research. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nader al -Bizri. I'm a professor of civilization studies and philosophy at the American University of Beirut. And I'm currently affiliated with the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. And my area is in philosophy, intellectual history, and architectural theory. Good morning, everybody. My name is Zahir Alam. Um, I'm associated with Sorbonne University in France and Deakin University, where I do research on smart and sustainable cities. And I'm involved in policy and consultancy work in, uh, on urban regeneration in different African cities. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Livia Tomova. I'm a research fellow at the University of Cambridge, and my field of research is cognitive neuroscience. I'm specifically interested in how different stressors, um, including loneliness, affect cognition and brain function in adolescence. Great. So we all know who we are. <laughs> <laughs> and also the audience knows a little bit more about ourselves. What's fun about today is that none of the explorers know more than the audience. Uh, they just know that the theme is movement. And uh, we have prepared a few cards here. And there is going to be an image. Uh, I'd like you to hold it. Uh, show it to the audience, and if you can, just also say what you see. And then from what we see in the card, we will try to ideate and uh, start a discussion. And I would like to ask Livia, if possible, uh, to come up and take the first card. Okay. So what do you <laughs> see? <laughs> it's a car, I would say. All right. <laughs> so the way this works is um, you'll try to think, what does a car represent? for you in terms of movement, and if mm. you can also bring your discipline in it. Oh, okay, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> well, I would say, well, for movement, it's quite obviously a device for transportation. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess in many positive ways, as it enables us to move through different areas, but also most, um, when we th uh, think about um, environment and things like that, probably most recently very much connotated in a negative way as um, driving cars has been something that people have tried to reduce in the past. It's quite challenging to think of it in a cognitive neuroscience way. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, I mean, one thing I, I guess I can think of is how, how in neuroscience one thing that people are trying to do now most recently is that they're trying to see whether behavioral changes can be predicted um, through, for example, um, differences in brain activity. So that's one area of research that has come up quite recently where, where people are looking at who is responsive to certain arguments and from there try to predict in real life who will follow then certain kind of recommendations in terms of policy making and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a really new area of research and I'm not... I'm a bit skeptical how successful it will be, but I think that's that's kind of a quite interesting, um, well, 
possibly future direction um, cognitive neuroscience can go to. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> and as a neuroscientist myself, I'd also, now that you took it there, I'd also think of self-driving cars, training cars to uh, act like humans. Um, and make decisions, um, and already the first self-driving cars have come from several companies, and there's still the technology is still being made, but there's mm. strides to be made already on that. Mm. And you already brought up a very interesting point about sustainability, and I'm sure maybe you can also yeah. ideate on that. This is a very interesting subject because cars and cities have been um, in contention and challenging each other for for vast period of time. And interestingly, with the pandemic, things have changed because mm -hmm. now, uh, with global lockdowns around the world, in any part where large portion of the population were forced in their homes, mm -hmm. cars were not allowed on the streets, and cities turned into ghost towns. And interestingly, this shifted also the dyna dy market dynamics. Because while many companies were falling in, a, uh, were facing economic crisis, a co companies like Tesla, for the first time, was larger in market capitalization than Ford, which was a, a legacy company. So it really says about how much cars are changing in terms of function. It's not a car nowadays is not only a, 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 an equipment you take you from A to B. It's a whole computer system, just to develop the technology for self-driving. For example, demands entirely new new uh, IT infrastructure, then a specialized lens, a specialized computing power, and so on. And now, interestingly, as well, for sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, this opens up new discourses, because what happens when the car can communicate with a building next to it, with the streets, with a vast array of IoT, mm -hmm. Internet of Things, sensors around, around the city? Mm -hmm. And what if we can now, with all this richness and vast sea of data, put it open, where everybody can tap into this open source data and create their own solutions for the city. So it now be becomes very, very interesting. How do we move and, and shape our city with this data and also with, with, with the influx of vehicles around us? And isn't this a philosophical question? Mm -hmm. uh, what can we do with this data? Where can, where can we take this? And who can tap into them and about the security of this data? Do you have anything to contribute uh, actually, to this? Actually, before we just focus on data itself, mm -hmm. uh, we could return to the, to the car and to the issue of sustainability and the way it impinges on the manner we apportion the possibilities of our terrestrial dwelling now, mm -hmm. not only in the urban domain, but in urbanizing uh, the landscape, so even on the natural environment. And there are evidently ecological uh, consequences to this that maybe through technicity we might be able to mediate them in terms of natural resources. But if we return to this idea of data, Internet of Things, uh, smart cars, we are uh, engaging in a domain that uh, will increase the inframing of our being as uh, individuals who live in their embodied situated uh, condition in the flesh on uh, uh, entities that have capabilities eventually of taking decisions that are not only of a functional nature but of ethical consequences. Mm -hmm. And we are ceding more and more our agency to uh, the unfolding of technique. And this is one feature of it. Adding to the Internet of Things and AI and the industries that will fuel this new mode of uh, arranging human condition, mm -hmm. um, we will be driven further on depending on fur on enhancement of the physical realm mm -hmm. through a semblance of multisensory experience that blends the physical with the virtual. Mm -hmm. And this by itself um, is a territory that we mm -hmm. haven't encountered in terms of the human experience in the flesh to date. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I maybe add to that? Because when you were talking about this, it reminded me of an experiment that I um, heard from a talk from a professor, I don't remember at which university now, but they were studying whether they could make a car drive in a certain way based on the, I think it was pupil dilation uh -huh. of a person in the car. And they found that whenever the person was looking in a certain way, the car would slow down and make them kind of allow them to explore the area more. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so interesting and it reminded me of you know, like what you just said, that there could be like an interaction almost that the car would respond to the driver inside and 
sort of try to figure out what the driver wants, <laughs> which obviously also has a lot of ethical implications, I would mm. think. What if the car makes a mistake? Then it's a <laughs> <laughs> it's a matter of health. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe one point before we uh, move to Aku. Uh, the idea of territorialization is is very important because in the field of cities, Nader knows it very well. The car is very destructive to human life, mm -hmm. and this is actually a legacy of uh, modernist urban planning. For example, mm -hmm. Le Corbusier provided the planning framework for cities. He, he said that. I will live 60 miles from my office and my secretary will live 60 miles from the other direction and we burn fuel and roads mm. because those are plentiful but those are no longer plentiful. Mm. So we, we are left behind the legacy which doesn't work anymore in our, con in our current times and it is urgent for, for change. But it is, we've gone very, very far because cities are now sprawling beyond reach and the legacy of the car has to go. So whether we turn towards electric car or reduce mobility is a big question nowadays. Interesting. Maybe Aku can also add something to the same to this topic, or we could even move to a new card. So and even try to uh, connect it with maybe with cars. So uh, has any anything sparked your uh, curiosity? From what is uh, said? A lot has sparked okay. my curiosity. <laughs> I <Christina>. was sure. <laughs> um, but this is really interesting because I think, you know, the car, as we're speaking about uh, its relation to cities and people, represents sort of two, there's two elements here. So on the one side, there's the element of the car and um, the advances that uh, can be made technologically, but also the considerations ar around green um, and, and alternative uh, modes of mobility. And so we're thinking about the, the environmental and sustainability elements and how that relates to the health and well-being of people who are in cities. But then there's another side to it, which is that um, in many places in cities, people don't have cars. And so the actual access um, to a car, what it represents in terms of, um, you know, social level or social class, mm -hmm. which denotes a person's health status or health well-being is also the, the other side of it. So the, the car, as it relates to the people and to the cities, is sort of two-pronged um, and what it can tell us about the health and well-being of people in in those cities. Um, and so I think in terms of how we measure, you know, what, what the car adds or what the car represents, it can be both sort of positive in terms of advances, but it also can be negative in the sense that we're speaking about a technology for many, it, it's even out of reach. Mm -hmm. And so how we consider how um, the health of a people in a particular uh, urban environment Mm -hmm. Okay. No problem. A little echoey. Is it better now? Okay. A few technical problems. Yes. Oh. No, not at all. Not a I can shout. <laughs> <laughs> I will go with the cliche. This happens in a live session. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it's the technology. Is that better? Yeah? Yeah. So I should use this. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I won't repeat everything that I've said, but I, I w was just making the point that the car as a technology as it relates to people in an urban setting represents two things. And it's very exciting that the car can be um, a sign of progress in terms of how we think about greening spaces and, and alternative modes of, of mobility. But it's also the case that the car also represents um, a certain level of um, status that for, for many is, is unreachable in mm -hmm. cities and both have effects on how we measure health and well-being of, of communities and cities. So I think we have to think about about um, you know, both the positive and the negative side of what cars represent uh, as a technology connecting people into their built-up environments. Yes, it is really interesting because a car, for most people, signifies freedom, but if you don't have access to a car and a city has become very reliant to them, it can, ver it can be a very limiting factor. You're absolutely right. Uh, thank you for bringing this up. Maybe I could ask for a second card. Maybe Nader can uh, do this for, sure. for us now. You can also relate to what has already been said. Or <laughs> So what do you see in the card? You have to show oh, to right. the audience. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. Um, I see something that, uh, well, it's, it's an old uh, device for uh, online uh, yeah. PlayStation. Exactly, it is the PlayStation um, controller. <laughs> I, I think it is more for those who are in their 19-year-old or that bracket, because my younger son is using something more complex than this, uh-huh. which is... Uh, um, so, first thing, from a parent's standpoint, I see the immersion of my my son more and more into the online environment. Uh, his aspiration uh, soon is to get the goggles. And this causes <laughs> friction in how we're going to relate to these because the PlayStation is already introducing these young uh, minds to the element of the metaverse. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, they are already pushed before us as adults to enter into the online environment and see it as being something that um, enhances their experience, Mm -hmm. which is an experience that is uh, gradually taking away from the actual embodied mobility. Mm -hmm. So the semblance of being in an environment and uh, turning through a proprioception, our kinesthetic body into a situation that I tap it into an avatar, give me the semblance of mediating space-time, but in reality, I'm still more or less stationary in, our, in, in my uh, actual embodied situation. So, um, I see this as um, a, 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 an aspect that indicates somehow that our being in the physical world has an impoverished character to it. Mm -hmm. And part of the impoverished character to it comes also from the sense that we might become bored from the physical realm and seek ways of mediating that boredom. But boredom by itself is a disposition that makes us reflect on something fundamental about the way we relate to time Mm -hmm. and more important than space itself. And time is what apportions our thrones into the world in being destined to death. So as a mortal, in a sense, the, na- the sense of boredom itself opens up the kernel of our ontological angst in the sense that it makes us reflect on who we are and our temporal predicament. So that escapism is uh, dangerous because ultimately it's going to alter the reflective meditation on what does it mean to be alive. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's one aspect to it. Another one is an alteration of what is innately uh, the domain or realm that pertains to our cognitive faculty, which is space and time through which Mm -hmm. we organize the manifestations of the empirical aspect of the senses. And if we become more dependent on a virtual realm in mediating space-time, it's going to alter the basis of experience altogether. Mm. And with it, thinking. Especially connecting it now with the technology of virtual reality, that you can actually feel that you're immersed in the game. So you can indeed alter how you perceive the reality around you. And identity and... Yeah. Yeah. but isn't there also, there, there's also positive things, of course, uh, to gaming. For example, I can think of gamification to achieve mm. uh, certain roles. I'm sure um, in sustainable cities is already um, an idea that's being introduced, how to um, test certain ideas using gamification. Have you any examples of that? Yeah, you're completely right. And actually, this is very much a tool as much as it a tool for entertainment. And Stephen Johnson uh, wrote a very interesting book called Everything Bad is Good for You. Mm-hmm. And one of the chapters where the structure of the book is very interesting, where each chapter he discusses a, topi- a, topi- a topical theme. And one of the themes was games. And today this is a, a major pillar of the global economy. It brings more money than Hollywood. So you imagine the importance of games nowadays. And there are and professional gamers are very much celebrated than professional athletes, where today there's an international game competition uh, where the winner gets $1 million. So you imagine even more than athletes. Mm-hmm. So this is very much an economy uh, of tomorrow. And interestingly, 
in cities where uh, cities are becoming increasingly digitalized, where everything is being mapped, uh, recorded, and stored. You can create di digital rep replicas. This concept is known as digital twins. And now many games actually evolve within a digital twin of the city, where you can go through the game, through the storyline, and you, you see yourself immersed in, for example, real life New York, where you can mm -hmm. see things in, uh, just like it would have been, and provide you an opportunity as, as well for people who can't afford to travel to those places for some period of time to immerse yourself into a new environment. I very much agree with Nadia that this also comes with heavy maybe mental implications, social implications as well, where we need to thread very, very carefully. But it also opens opportunities for people who don't have the means to explore other avenues. Uh, another dimension which is very interesting and uh, maybe the audience can relate is the recent uh, disaster for Notre Dame, the mm. church that burned in Paris. Mm. Interestingly, to, for the rebuilding, it has been very, very complex. And one source of archive for the rebuilding was Assassin's Creed, mm -hmm. the game. Mm -hmm. yes. Why? Because for the, for the mapping of Assassin's Creed, uh, the designers had to go through the archives and study closely how the church was mapped. Why? Because the, the main character, uh, in audio, I forgot the name, <laughs> of the game had to jump from, from the assassin. tower. <laughs> so uh, they had to map everything in detail. And the rebuilding now is largely part because of Assassin's, Assassin's Creed. Mm -hmm. So today, the game industry is not only, only for entertainment, it, but it opens a vast uh, array of research into other, other fields. And for, so this is a, a, an idea in itself in, in terms of the economy. And for cities as well, mm -hmm. for having those, and, and Nadir mentioned this for, as a metaverse, is incredibly, incredibly interesting because we have digital twins. And through the digital twins as well, we can enact scenarios. What if we implement this new source of mobility in the city, in the digital twin, how will it react? And then we have an uh, alternative universe, alternative cities. It becomes very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. I can also think of another uh, similar example uh, where we needed, obviously, in the beginning of the pandemic to solve the structure of the spike protein of, uh, of the virus. And uh, it was done through gaming. Uh, people all across the globe were asked to solve different algorithms and test different things. And it turned to more of a... Uh, systems uh, giant challenge where people who would not have access to this before and maybe had fresh eyes were working at the same time with the scientists. And um, it led to obviously uh, something quicker happening. And um, maybe we can also ideate on the movement of ideas and imagination through gaming. Maybe. Aku, you could uh, add something? Well, I'm, I'm struck by the comment that Nader made, which is the question, you know, what does it mean to be alive? And so when I look at the console, what I actually see are, from the health perspective, certainly the concerns around uh, increasing non-communicable diseases, mm -hmm. which have been problems in high-income countries, but increasingly we're seeing those burdens of disease rising in low- and middle-income countries. Mm -hmm. And it, it creates a strain on governments because uh, it, Preventative care is expensive. And so when you have increasing rates of obesity, you have increasing rates of diabetes, you have increasing rates of um, you know, heart uh, conditions because people are not getting outside. Mm -hmm. Children are not running around and climbing trees. And, and so there has to be a, a balance, certainly, between um, the encouragement of, of what the technologies can offer and all of the opportunities mm. to be able to experience uh, virtual and alternative realities that maybe are not in the present. But there is something to say around uh, the physicality of, of health mm -hmm. and how do you encourage that, um, you know, how do you offer programs, how do you uh, ensure that governments have enough resources to be able to um, keep these, these sort of rates of non-communicable diseases uh, low. Mm -hmm. And it remains a challenge because um, you can't restrict people's freedom to use technology, mm -hmm. but you also realize that if there's a way to be preventative and, and have people healthy in sort of the fullness of their bodies, what do you put in place to encourage that, or at least to balance those? Mm -hmm. So that's what, what came to mind um, just by that comment. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
And I don't know, Livia, would you like to add? Oh, something? absolutely. Of course. I, would like to <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. You're ready. <laughs> so it's really interesting because I would, I would have um, thought of something completely different seeing this image, and I love that um, this went in a very different direction. <laughs> but to <laughs> me, looking at an online um, game console is like very clearly related to because I'm doing this research to this kind of um, debate in society whether whether these online games and the virtual interactions that people have, how that influences our society mm -hmm. in a way that most of our interactions, and especially in young people, um, with their friends happen now virtually. And actually many boys, specifically boys actually, um, tend to have many of their social interactions in online games mm -hmm. rather than running around and playing maybe outside. So I think this is such an interesting development in our society. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure where this will go, but obviously it, it opens many questions um, that were not opened so far um, throughout, I guess, history. Like, what does it actually mean um, for people to connect to others? And if we connect to others virtually, would that be the same thing? Um, as we would do sitting next to each other in a room. And all these questions are really, well, these questions were never important so far, but now they're so important because we live in a society where so much happens virtually. I mean, just going through a pandemic, we all yeah. know, right? So um, yeah, this is a topic I'm, I'm really interested in also in my own research. So that's why um, it immediately came to my mind. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'd like just to, to add a, a sort of footnote to what, to what you said, uh, you know, and it's the elephant in the room always, uh, economics and profit and finance. Mm -hmm. And partly, yes, the intersubjective relations are transferred to avatars. So, um, you know, they, it's not only within the same room that they communicate uh, digitally, so they are physically in the same room, but mm -hmm. uh, inhabiting the online environment. Uh, but also there's a commerce. So, for instance, uh, you know, a little gift to, to my son, since how I link it now to the personal rather than just the abstract, uh, a gift to my son turned out to be a hat online that is more expensive than an actual hat that you will buy <laughs> in, in a shop. And this is the kind of impress on young minds that these industries are having, which have real cost in the mm -hmm. physical world mm. in sucking up our labor. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's moving money inside yeah. Yeah. the games. Yeah. <laughs> and this is actually very, very interesting because again, another case during the pandemic that we saw was uh, companies were crushing down in the stock market and there was one company in particular called GameStop. The business <laughs> of the company yeah. mm -hmm. was selling, uh, selling <laughs> physical video games. But this was crazy <laughs> because then we saw companies shorting the stock, which means they're betting that the company would fail. Yes. And large companies like Citadel, which is a major fund, and BlackRock was shorting the stock. And then all of a sudden, a group of retail investors uh, decided to support their stock and then it blew out of proportion from five dollars to hundred to th uh, yeah it was it, it increased by ten to, to thirty times the, the retail price and what happened was Citadel lost up to fourteen billion dollars traditional mm. investors so it just shows how a group of retail investors which just like the concept of gaming which really was mm. the support of everybody during the pandemic decided to support this gaming industry and this was a first also in traditional markets so it really shows the mm. power of up to where people will go to save uh, this culture. Well, I, think, I think this is so interesting also, also in, in terms of what you said earlier with, the, with our physical presence and, and kind of relating it almost to death. But I think, I mean, the question, like if our like, whole world moves to a digital world and we buy this hat that is more important now in the digital world, what does it mean to our real life presence? Like, do we leave it behind and then it doesn't, well, you see what I'm trying to get at. I mean, obviously we don't, for, but I think that this balance is, is really interesting. Like, where will this go and, and how will we move <laughs> our, our, like, minds? Mm. Uh, well, you know, maybe it's a dystopic projection, but we are re-entering Plato's cave. Mm -hmm. mm. Shackled, mm -hmm. yeah. We will see where this goes. Where it goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe it can go to the to the next card for now. Uh, maybe Aku can pick up a card this time. Certainly. All right. 
So what do you see? I have a teddy bear. Mm -hmm. How do you think that would relate to movement? Uh -huh, you have uh -huh. a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a tough one. Very interesting. It can be, for example, the absence of moving, because this is an inanimate object, but it can also spark movement of imagination for someone. So um, it can be both very static, but also very uh, moving, uh, but maybe not in the real world. Can you maybe ideate on that or? Well, I think what's interesting is, is that when, when I opened the card, we all kind of had the same reaction. We all knew what it was and it was sort of this, um, this, this sense of comfort. Mm. And yet many of us live in places where we don't have real bears, but we all understand yeah. what this is. <laughs> this is a, a teddy bear is a sign of love and comfort and it's a fairly universal sign. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had to think of where did the teddy bear originate from, I don't actually know. I would love, I would love if anybody has the history mm -hmm. of teddy bears, but I think the manner in which the teddy bear as a concept has kind of circled the, the planet, no matter where you mm. go. If you give a teddy bear, you know, either to your beloved or to a child or to someone in a hospital, they under, the, the meaning is the same. Yeah, right. And so I think actually in terms of movement, the, the moving of the idea of the mm -hmm. teddy bear, somehow it has gone around the world and somehow it means the same thing mm -hmm. in, in all of the places, yeah. Yeah, it is maybe because we all seek the same comfort, it, it feels warm and fuzzy, and of course, uh, yeah. So it is interesting how, you're right, it, it has become a global uh, idea that may, maybe a lot of children will never see a bear in real life. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, can you think of maybe, because I'm, I'm turning it to neuroscience, I know, but uh, can you think of maybe ways a teddy bear has been used in research to uh, elicit different responses. I know I'm setting you to a certain path, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not actually sure which path now. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, uh, it has been used in research too with uh, macaque monkeys, I think, to uh, okay. research the presence or non-presence mm. of uh, a parental figure. Yeah, and, that's a uh, very dark path. <laughs> 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 no, but then this is what uh, we can and also think that it signifies a mm. parental figure in our life and how mm. uh, this gift can move uh, a child as well. Mm. So it can also, we can also take movement to an emotional uh, part, something that moves us. So maybe mm. we can ideate on that. Mm. I mean... The, the experiments you were describing, I think they are, in my opinion, highly controversial, actually. So they were about how, what kind of, whether, whether, well, in this case, macaques as a social species, how that would influence their cognition and behavior if they were to grow up without um, a parent and instead would have, well, just like some, something soft. And obviously they had um, very strong um, negative effects of that, like really deeply disturbing effects, and um, I mean, it shows how important social contact, I would say, is throughout our development, and I'm not sure how to relate that best to movement, but I guess it, it does show in a way, I guess maybe, maybe almost like an opposite of movement, that, that there is something very stable also in how we grow up, and mm -hmm. that is also true not only for humans, but across all different species that are social species, is that we, there is a, like a core need that we have, and that is to to have this basic interaction with uh, someone when we are born, and this is something everyone needs across, mm -hmm. well, different species even, so not just different cultures. So this is, a, this is something I would say that would never move. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah. We can also go mm. to a different card, yeah. so I was thinking but if... Maybe I'll write to react mm -hmm. to Aku's uh, comment. I think I this is actually very interesting because if I see a bear here today, my first instinct would not go to go and hug it. <laughs> so it's very strange how, how this idea got developed because we all saw the revenant. The bear wasn't very cuddly there. Uh, but also another uh, path would be to look at the bear as a product. Mm -hmm. And then it opens the idea of the movement of 
service mm -hmm. and capital flows and product as well. Okay. And interestingly, with the pandemic, we saw the backlog of containers around the world and the price of freight increased to some places up to eight times. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very interesting because recently in, the begin uh, in February, we saw headlines that some countries and companies are starting to order Christmas presents in February. So then again, it shows uh, how those kind of products impact on the, on the whole supply chain and the stress it's being placed uh, in different countries because mm -hmm. the person consuming the beer for some strange reasons in, in uh, Mauritius or Ghana where we don't have beers, but uh, those are probably being manufactured, the, the wool is being manufactured in, in some countries and then shipped to other places around the world. So the sustainability aspect is quite... Mm -hmm. It's quite uh, yes. typical on, mm -hmm. on this sense, and the fairness and the equity as well. Then we go into the area of uh, provision of services. If it's if that for making that child happy, we are making another child unhappy mm -hmm. by working in factories. So the idea and uh, maybe the morality of the bear can be placed into mm. question here. I'd like to stay a bit with the teddy bear Let's because stay. I'll pick on on the aspects that are social. So there is an acculturation process and therefore the bear that would have made uh, some kind of an impress that connects with the uh, actual physical attestation and experience, let's say in North America, is now you know, becoming also so dear to a uh, child uh, in the Middle East, let's say. Mm -hmm. So there is that aspect of the imagination that you evoke that relates to the issue of representation and in a fashion that evokes some kind of skill of the, of the craft. Mm -hmm. And here it borders on the art. But also acculturation is the dominance of a particular culture in setting certain standards mm -hmm. and values in terms of how you uh, apportion the way you deal with your aesthetics or mm -hmm. even what you consider to be something that contributes to the well-being of your child. Mm -hmm. So it becomes something quite endearing. So this is one level of the movement. It, it invokes that kind of flow of economic, social, cultural uh, exchanges mm -hmm. and the artistic uh, depiction or representation. But then there is something much more personal, much more emotional. It, uh, immediately when I saw it, uh, it evoked uh, certain feelings of mm -hmm. childhood places that I once inhabited and left behind, mm. giving me also that kind of wondering thought, what happened to my teddy bear? Where was it left in the trail mm. of aging? Who departed the father that passed away that might have brought it to the home? Mm. The ailing, aging mother, the siblings displaced across the world because mm. of uh, distress on society. So this becomes a sort of imagining or the imaginal infiltrating what is reconstituted as a memory. But the memory is not entirely a recollection. It is an imagined recollection. Mm. And it is picking the trauma and the poetics of the space where that teddy bear would have lived in mm. childhood. I feel like Aku has something to add. She seems like she's taking it in and <laughs> I don't want to add, uh, Prof. Nader has just said it so beautifully, yeah. it's just it resting very... on me, yes. Yes. Oh, the, the issue of representation is actually uh, very strong that you brought it up, how uh, it is for sure something very interesting that we all unite under this feeling of this fuzzy uh, idea, but also um, that we have lost the opportunity maybe to relate to something even more meaningful or more unique or more representative of where we come from and what our ideas may have been and how maybe um, having the same toys may condition us towards uh, a certain culture to uh, take over more uh, because we know how impressionable you can be at the, this very young age. Uh, so the importance of diversity also in toys is uh, very, very high. Um, but maybe with that, we can also take another card. Mm -hmm. And now it would be your turn. <laughs> oh, more oh. toys. <laughs> can you show it to the yes. audience, please? Yes. It's building blocks. Yeah, very interesting. Um, <laughs> Again, in terms I of... I come from the subject of communities and cities. Uh, <laughs> so... 
<laughs> you see a city. <laughs> That's my subject. <laughs> Go for it. But, uh, <laughs> looking at this, it's very interesting because when, it ch when we were a child, we all build, try to build our own buildings and our cities in the way that we see it. And today we can very much do it. Uh, we are moving from uh, traditional build construction methods to structures that can be designed by anybody, built in a factory, and shipped on site, and constructed in exactly the way we want it, in a quarter, in a fraction of, of the speed and the cost. So this sort of uh, structure play, uh, structure, imaginative structure that we had in the past is now becoming very real today. And um, there are two ways which, which we can look at it for prefab structures built in factories. Those are becoming very high-tech, uh, where everything is becoming very detailed and very precise and exact. For example, if we build a door 102 millimeters, maybe we'll save enough material to have another 30 doors at, at cheaper prices and things like this. So. Uh, we can have an array, for example, of blocks of predefined doors, windows, panels, uh, roof structures, and we can build it in the way we imagine, and then the factory makes everything uh, in another part of the city and then ships it back, and then we can build it. Or the other side as well, in the, in, uh, the global south or in countries that don't have the capacity to invest into prefab materials or simply don't have the scale uh, to mm -hmm. invest into those uh, scenarios, we, we find uh, construction techniques which we can do ourselves. And one is very, very interesting, I think that they're smiling, is the uh, traditional architecture, which is now coming back to light, mm -hmm. simply because of the cost of materials. Uh, I was speaking to Maria uh, uh, during the week. For example, in, in my case, I'm, I'm building a house this year in Mauritius. We started doing the plans in December. Mm -hmm. I'm getting the permit this month, but in the last six months, it's already unaffordable because the price of construction increased by threefold mm -hmm. because of the war which is happening in Ukraine and Russia. And I live in Mauritius. Yes. So yeah. this uh, sort of traditional building is now becoming obsolete and we are very much turning towards this. And, and for us, it's not a matter of only designing and to acquire buildings, um, materials which can be imported, but now we're turning towards solutions which we can meet on site because yes. we're forced to do it. And it's actually more sustainable as well. Mm -hmm. And we know traditional buildings have been standing for, for millennia mm -hmm. and built from, from earth, sourced mm -hmm. locally. Mm -hmm. So why not bringing this back on the table? And interestingly, now the idea of stabilized bricks a stabilized rammed earth is, is coming back on the agenda. And it's, and it's very simple. What do we have as materials? Clay, soil, and uh, some straw. Mm -hmm. And now with the idea of stabilization, we add up to 3% cement uh, as binding component. Mm -hmm. So this can be decreased and new forms um, of materials can emerge from this as well. Yeah, so the idea of bringing, building your Build perfect your house, adventure. <laughs> at an affordable cost and at affordable speed can, can actually be implemented today. And also, in doing this, we all, all used to play for, with those structures with our friends. And before, the construction of a house was pretty much done. Uh, it was a matter of, co of community. community. Oh, community. My father told mm. me himself when he built his house, it was his friends that were helping to, to mm. lay blocks and bricks. Mm. But now we lost this. Mm. We somehow pay foreigners and, uh, as a service. Mm. So I think this should come back now to yeah. make a house a home. I really like how you're bringing up community. Uh, so maybe we can ideate on this, but it's only five minutes to the break. So uh, let's just keep that in mind. So uh, would you like to say anything about community? Uh, yes, it, it's a prolongation of what Zahir uh, has mm -hmm. said and taking it to something that gives it uh, a sort of, you know, uh, reconnection with the historical aspect of re, uh, reworking the vernacular out of what is left uh, as the ruins of previous civilizations mm. and the issue of decay, weathering uh, and the capability of retrieval of mm -hmm. what is left from those who came to pass mm -hmm. as a way of building for the contemporaries and in the future and this is this is something that is more historical that we have lost. Um, but there is another uh, side to it apart from the issue of evoking imag imagination as a way of reconstituting out of this 
a limited set of entities, various spatial organizations, like different shapes. It's the idea that ultimately what you are constructing uh, contains already within its, uh, its fabric uh, its undoing. And um, it, it scares me the idea that um, if you come from a background of childhood of a society in strife and war, mm. this becomes a, a setting where you reenact the, the manifestation of the destruction of your city in mm. your own uh, bedroom. And this becomes a, a way of doing it with material that you could reconstruct and destroy. Mm. And it scares me now how in gaming industry, most of the major battles in history are now can be inhabited mm. by, by gamers. Uh, perhaps this will diffuse our bellicosity or increase, uh, increase our penchant towards violence. Mm. I was, because you mentioned war again and you also spoke about war, I think this is so interesting um, from this house, but I, I thought about what you said about also the Ukraine and how, how your house became unaffordable, and now you spoke about war as well, I thought the interesting part is how it kind of highlights also how interconnected our world has become and mm -hmm. how certain really far away happenings and dynamics are influencing us. But I think now go going to a neuroscience perspective, it is so interesting to then look at how we as people operate as humans and that, for example, things like empathy mm -hmm. are really hard to... So we know that from research that people are really bad actually at empathizing with others that are really far away and yes. like this abstract thought about war and someone suffering is much harder to sort of um, directly feel versus when you see someone in pain directly in front of you it's a very direct and clear response and I think this is so interesting now knowing all these things that we, we know so much from like media for example we are given so much information and we know there's wars happening but it's it's really it makes us sort of feel like well what are we supposed to do about it? And I, I think this is, I mean, the thought came up when you, when you mentioned Ukraine and how it influences how you built your house. I think this is such an also interesting development of mm. where we are going in our society in this direction, yeah. It is in a way bringing closer problems that somebody is facing far away, mm. now bringing them at least in a way that you'll at, relate to them and think about it. Well, and the question is, I guess, can we, I mean, Speaking again as a brain scientist, are we able to do that? Is that something that, as a human coming from a monkey who was very mm -hmm. ultimate, immediate, physical, so this is how our brains operate and are developed, but then having this abstract idea coming from an abstract tool, which is our TV or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting to see whether, whether that actually would work for us. Or I mean, we already see that um, in certain ways our society is not as empathic as it could be. Mm. So. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would like to thank you for the first session. We will now be taking uh, a 20-minute break. It will also be a 20-minute break for online. And uh, for the people here, uh, we'd like to see you again back at 10.10. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you so much for the first session. Thank you. Okay.
Welcome to the second session, everyone, uh, on the topic of movement in, in Stockholm Explorative Talks. And uh, we're continuing our discussions. And we're using, again, obviously, the cards as a, a starting point. We had very interesting discussions even in the break. <laughs> so it would have been very nice if we were mic'd up during the break. <laughs> um, but um, I would like to invite... Uh, maybe Nadir to take the first uh, card. And mm -hmm. I'll pick randomly. Yeah, you pick a card, <laughs> uh, a random one. That's very good. And now it's words. Whoa. Mother Earth. In terms of the va it's an ocean of ideas yes. that suggests itself. Absolutely. Um, what does it mean to have, you know, our dwelling as terrestrial beings under the heavenly vault, um, and in the manner that we no longer consider it to be significant, the celestial order, in terms of our place in, in the universe? and how this, until recent times, would have been the basis upon which we established our values in terms of relation to truth, beauty, and goodness. And that preoccupation with our terrestrial affairs without an onlook on our place in the cosmos uh, has resulted in an immersion more and more in our human condition with what is elegant and unelegant about it, mm. without frames of reference other than our history that carries with it strife and trauma, um, and within it also bright opportunities for discovering how much we belong to each other in terms of cultures, civilizations, and our encounters, and the way our traditions have had synergies and confluences that our present preoccupation with our terrestrial dwelling seems to conceal and veil and turn us into people, nations and communities pitted against each other. Even though in the past the quarrel on, in apportioning our terrestrial affairs also derived many of the elements of its strife and uh, conflict from an onlook from Earth onto the cosmos and how we received through it the, what was conceived as intimations and signs of the divinities. So looking at Mother Earth also uh, in the era that is marked by the flight of divinities, and I mean by divinities, values that can have certain universal appeal that exceeds our contemporary condition. And under this, um, all aspects of what it is to be earthly uh, are called into uh, being questions to meditate upon. In many ways, I also, when I think of earth, I, I just think of it, it is a way that makes us human, our connection with earth and how we may have lost it right now, but humanity started when we started conquering Earth, walking. So what it is to be human is to be able to walk the Earth, to feel the, the rhythm of uh, the seasons, to react uh, to certain ways. Um, so do you maybe have anything to add, uh, Aku or Livia, or where should I take it? I, I certainly would add, uh, Christina, thank you okay. very much. Uh, for this provocation, and I suppose my starting point might be a little bit differently, a different, Christina, from yours, mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about uh, where humanity started. But I would say that instead of having a perspective of humanity started from a place of conquering the earth, mm -hmm. I see it as humanity having started as being made a steward over the mm -hmm. earth. And part of the problems that we see right now is because we haven't fulfilled that stewardship role. But if I pick on what Prof Nader has said and sort of bring a little bit of complexity science into some of the climate change debates, what I find which is really interesting is, is that, you know, we, we look at the question of climate change and we wonder what are the different layers of complexity that we're dealing with. 
So of course we have the ecological system that we're trying to respond to and how that is adapting to the various ecological changes. But there's also the political and the sovereign, the sovereignty of nation states and the fact that each country has its own vested interests in terms of how it relates to the earth, which may or may not be in line with ecology. Mm -hmm. But then we also have um, the, 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 the governance around how decisions are getting made. Um, we, have the, the, we have companies and corporate systems that are also related to um, financial incentives uh, for how we relate to the earth. But then we come to also to the point of um, you know, the various religious and cultural perspectives mm -hmm. and those systems. And what we have to understand is that, that that layering of complexity, we all have different reasons for what we think Mother Earth is in mm -hmm. terms of the sovereignty of the nation state, in terms of the, um, the, the, the financial bottom line of corporations, in terms of the cultural and the religious aspects. And so part of our ability to respond to this climate crisis will only take place when we can find where those interfaces of those various systems are and where can you now bring spaces for negotiation or understanding to say, well, what do we do now? So I, it's very complex, but I think we only look at some of those systems, we don't look at all of them, and we can never come to a complete solution if we don't look at, you know, where these systems interact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, yeah, I'm happy to add to that. So I think um, these are really interesting points, and, and especially this, what you said about human nature, I think that's something that made me think, which is a, a topic I'm, I'm quite often kind of really intrigued about, which is, I wonder, because you spoke about conquering the earth and then maybe not, so I do wonder sometimes what, what is it with human nature and how do we treat our earth and how we, do we treat whatever we do in a way that sometimes, I f well, humanity is surely quite complex in itself and there are aspects of it that are, that are quite predatory, I would say, and then it makes me wonder, well, is there ever a solution? Maybe we just are that way. But then, but then we also have this immense... Um, this capacity for, for cooperation and prosociality, for example. And, for example, in, in, in research we know that um, humans are the most cooperative animals of all. And that is kind of really fascinating, isn't it? Given also how, how we're not cooperative in so many ways. And I do wonder often, well, what would it be, what would it need that we kind of really can tap into this immense potential for cooperation and sort of use this as a, as a way to then help um, or, or guide our own behaviors so that we can make certain decisions that are then um, helpful, for example, for sustainability and Mother Earth. Um, I'm not sure what the solution is. I think, I think we are, at the moment, we're not quite there yet, I think. I think this is very interesting because actually one of the first cities in Turkey, Kaya Holyuk, I think, is, um, was formerly structure with no power structures. So everybody was equal, mm. all buildings were equal, same, same typology and same height as well. So at some point it really makes us wonder, where did we go astray? <laughs> <laughs> From no power to absolute power. And now those absolute power find itself in economic structures as well and fueling climate change structures and, and as we know it. Um, I'm an expert reviewer for the IPCC and the latest report really, really shows it. And it, shows, it says that we need deep and rapid decarbonization for our own survival. But then again, how do we do this? Rapid decarbonization for, West, for the global north is maybe easier than that for the global south, because the global south doesn't simply have the financial means to do it. Mm -hmm. And this rapid globalization, we need uh, to look at the moral imperatives of this as well. It is very urgent that we do this, but uh, where did we come to this front? Uh, this is the, this uh, landscape of global inequality for climate inequality started very much uh, at the foundation of colonialism, powering uh, industrialization of the global north. So now, how do we repair this inequality while powering this drive of global uh, deep decarbonization needs? So there is really much a sort of global cooperation needed if we need to repair the scars of, of colonization and the scars and the fragments of, of this pain. Mm -hmm. And also listening to Nader about uh, 
the ethical and moral imperatives. Oh, this was very, very interesting. And two books came to mind. There's a book, a very nice book written by Parak Kana called Connectography. And interestingly, it shows that even though we have many disputes between nations, we ha actually have in more infrastructures connecting nations. Mm -hmm. When you look at all the roads, all the bridges, all the digital infrastructures happening, they're actually more connecting us than dividing us. Mm -hmm. So then we can really reflect on what this imaginative line between two territories, how much these, these are dri uh, driving us apart. And it, it raises very much social uh, questions. And the second book, also very interesting, by Johan Norberg, called Progress. While the media promotes, very much promotes us as a uh, fragmented world, we made progress at very, very long strides. We have less mortality, we, education is there. Um, poverty is even less, even wars are less today. But we see it every day, we have the sense that it's more because we see it through, the pro mm. through uh, media, accentuated through media. So the world is really doing much better, but there's still much more to be done. Mm. So how do we do this while questioning our moral imperatives so that our actions not only render even better livability for our immediate territory, mm. but for the global landscape mm. as, as a sort? And I think this will demand major innovations on global structures of power, economics, mm. and okay. social structures. Can I just pick up on something you just said? I think you made a really interesting point, which is that actually many things are, well, wars have decreased and things like that. And there is, now to also <laughs> talk about a book um, by Steven Pinker, who's a professor at Harvard. He, made, he wrote this book, Enlightenment Now. Mm. And it talks about exactly this issue that actually many things are much better nowadays in terms of equality and peace and all these things. But we kind of have this sensation that they aren't, that things are worse. And then one idea why that could be is that because we know so much, we know about everything that's going on in the world. And then we also know the negative things, of course. And that didn't, that was not the case before. So often people have this, um, this sensation or this feeling that, well, everything just becomes worse and worse. But actually, if you look at the numbers, it's not quite true. But it's quite interesting, though, that, that there is this discrepancy between what actually happens and what we think happens. But it's just that our tolerance level is different, we, uh, of course, now, and also having access to the information mm. to be able to change things. And we can even think of the topic of today's theme movement as like a social movement that needs mm. to happen, like a revolution uh, f towards climate change, towards reducing inequalities and... Uh, I feel like I interrupted you and you wanted to say something. No, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, you know, what came to my mind is a fable that is written over 1,000 years ago in uh, between Basra and Baghdad by mm -hmm. a group uh, known as the Brethren of Purity, Ikhwan al Safa. And in a large chunk of their encyclopedic uh, treatises, uh, they had the case of the animals against humanity before the king of the jinn. And it is bringing the creature of mud, the earthly mm. creature, the human, to a court case uh, before the uh, celestial creature of fire mm. uh, as a judge and arbiter. And the silent calling of the mother earth is articulated through the animals. Uh, giving their perspective on what we do to the environment, to plants, to animals, mm -hmm. and to each other. And the court case wasn't settled, it's still open. A calling from a thousand years ago. But it only saw possibilities, the only hope is that ultimately the cust custodian role of a humanity can only be achieved when all nations, all religions, all folks bring the finest virtues they have together into constituting the ideal of the perfect human. And that's the salvific message that comes in receiving the silent calling of Mother Earth. You always bring so, you bring it so beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ako. If I may, <clears throat> there was one thing that um, Zahir said that sort of stuck out in my mind and it was, um, you mentioned something about the, the artificiality of um, boundaries, like countries, and particularly uh, in Africa, you know, this is a, a major challenge for um, us because what you see is sort of 
countries that have been cobbled together uh, fairly recently, mm -hmm. but not along the lines of um, where the peoples are. So if I use West Africa as my, um, as my case here, in West Africa, what you have is you sort of have uh, ethnicities that move uh, horizontally. Mm -hmm. But the way that the countries were divvied up after the Treaty of Versailles was vertical. Mm -hmm. And so you split peoples. Mm -hmm. If I speak about Ghana and Togo, you have the Ewe people who, some are in Togo, some are in, in, in Ghana. And so that's, that's um, explains something about the challenges of what you do in a, in now in a sovereign nation state and how people relate to the land. Because mm -hmm. in a sense, in a modern way, it's a little bit artificial. Those aren't the lands, or the lands have been cut up, but not according to where the, the people are. And so when it comes to sharing the land or governing the land or, or taking decisions around whose land is this or whose voice counts for um, regulating the land, those, those, those things matter. And, um, and just on the fable that you just shared, it reminds me of a book that I'm, I'm currently reading, um, which is actually on indigenous theology. Uh, so written by um, an American pastor who is a, of Cherokee descent. And he speaks a lot about, um, you know, the, the whose land mm. it is, but he, he shares a very similar fable about uh, the animals being uh, taking um, this creature to, to court and making that, that, that regulation, making that, that judgment. So I think in terms of movement, um, how peoples relate to the land or why peoples feel they have to move uh, from a particular place, it relates to these artificial um, boundaries, it relates to um, all these, these sorts of issues of then who, who sits on the land, who stands on the land, who takes the decisions around, around the land. So uh, it's important. Thank you very much. I think we can also pick up another card. I think the matter of uh, Mother Earth will be repeating, I'm so sure, because it's the foundation of everything. And maybe Livia can pick up a card mm -hmm. this time. Shall I also do random? Uh, just a random one, yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Well, oh. myth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a good one. <laughs> um, well, what comes to my mind when I when I think of myth is something maybe maybe again slightly different. But what I think uh, of um, here is of something as um, we talk about certain things and ideas and everything that we actually know. Um, comes from other people, and one thing that has been that has come up a lot in in recent research that I'm not involved in, but that I that is happening around me, is the theme of misinformation. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a really really interesting topic, I think, and it it really makes you think. So, everything that we know is from other people. There is no other way that we sort of know information. But what happens if the other people tell us something that's wrong? Mm -hmm. um, and there are certain sort of now directions in specifically social psychology will people try to counter this uh, misinformation, sort of fake news and things like that. Um, so for example, one way how this has been done, um, this is a professor at Cambridge, he's called Alexander van der Linden, and he has developed this concept of a vaccine against um, misinformation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he uses sort of this analogy of a vaccine <laughs> that you give someone sort of a small dosage of the, of the bad thing, and it allows them to develop sort of an, an antibodies against the actual disease. So mm -hmm. the way they do that is that they develop the game where they let people um, spread misinformation themselves and tell them tactics how that would work. And so they, they learn the tactics of how someone can spread misinformation, for example, being very emotional and, and claiming to have expertise, things like that. And that supposedly, or at least his research is showing, that that can help um, sort of make people more aware of what, mm. of what misinformation is and what it isn't. So I think, I think that's, a, that's, a really, that's a really interesting topic. And I think it's, again, really, really timely because nowadays, um, as I said, everything that we know comes from other people. But also, nowadays, everyone can spread information. Mm. That is also something that has not been the case before, like who had access to, to talking to a big audience that has not been really a case before. And now, if I go on Twitter or mm -hmm. other platforms, I don't mean to specifically pick out one now, <laughs> um, 
I can I can share something and so many people might read it and I have so much power there. Um, so it's really interesting how, how should we or should we even um, regulate this kind of power? Mm. Mm. Anyway, that comes to my mind. <laughs> but that's very, very interesting because it is so surprising how misinformation spreads faster than the actual facts. Exactly. Um, yeah. Or it, it's probably because it's more sensational. So mm. it is uh, it evokes more emotions and of course then it's maybe more relatable and spreadable mm. in this way. Uh, and yeah, myths have always been passed down to uh, the next generation in, throughout history just by talking. And uh, many times we will have heard the same story, but a different version of the mm. same story. So they keep evolving together with society and what we know now and uh, how the teller relates to them. Um, uh, but that's, it's fascinating how this happens mm. and how fast it is. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy you went on, on fake news. I think this is a fantastic uh, new phenomenon. And you all know Harari writes also a lot about, about this. And in, in one of the chapters in 21 Lessons for, uh, for the 21st Century, he writes about the case of uh, the lost uh, American elections mm. and how the term fake news was attributed for almost everything that wasn't aligning to, the, mm -hmm. to a particular mm -hmm. party. So it's quite yeah. interesting, the classification, how do we actually define what is fake news and, and, and what not. And interestingly, even there was a survey done in the uh, recent French election between Macron and Le Pen, analyzing uh, the statistics that was port portrayed by both uh, candidates. And interestingly, it, uh, the, the survey showed that people did not necessarily believe scientific facts. They were more uh, believing what the other people said if they felt it aligned with the collective thoughts. Of course, yeah. So now we, we, we enter the era of how, what really is the role of science mm -hmm. against collective thoughts mm -hmm. and, and the resistance to change. Everything mm -hmm. becomes a myth. Even science mm -hmm. at some point will be classified as a myth. And this is very, very interesting because then we enter the, the theme of behavioral change. Mm -hmm. And in the case where I'm in sustainable cities and communities as well, and uh, we spoke about this with Nadir when we talk about contemporary urbanism. Now we have enough scientific evidence to show that contemporary practices is actually nefarious for our community. It's really, really bad. We are promoting unsustainable practices. We are destroying our biodiversity. Uh, it's it's uh, destructive to uh, mental well-being and so on. But still, modernism is still very well taught as a primary force in uh, architecture and urban schools because the star architects of today are on the front page of glossy magazines. So all emerging architects and uh, the youth are being led to design only for magazines, for an idea, for a myth, instead of really building for the people that would inhabit those spaces. So then we disconnect mm. from reality. Mm. We are building for imaginative characters, mm. just for, for superficial needs rather than Which humane really happens, needs. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Mm. So. Can I just say it quickly? Yeah, right absolutely. That? So I think this idea of building cities and with the mind of, of having, like, who lives in them is so interesting from a social perspective. So I, I used to never think about it much, but then I came into um, to speak at a lab that was working uh, with that. And the question was, how should we build a city so people can interact with each other mm. more and they become less lonely? And I thought this is such an interesting question. Of course we could, right? So yeah. there must be ways how, yeah. how we can do that versus not. And actually there is research on that I discovered then. Mm. Um, and I think this is such an interesting kind of just concept. You could kind of um, make people sort of um, interact in different ways. Mm. So that's a huge and um, quite a powerful thing to do, mm. actually, if you do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've also read a lot of research on that uh, topic. And it is uh, one, an aspect that came up all the time was making cities less reliant on cars mm. makes them not only obviously more sustainable, but more uh, sociable. Mm. People walk more, they meet each other, they have interactions. Whereas with cars, um, there's, there's always a need for big parking spaces uh, that divide neighborhoods mm. and that create unnatural uh, ways of navigating the city. Uh, and um, there's a need for like a, a new highway that 
uh, creates a circle around the city, which was a completely uh, not the natural flow of, uh, let's say, where mm. the stores are and where the rest of the people mm. will be. Mm. So yeah. uh, it is fascinating. This is very true as well. Just quickly, uh, one uh, example where you can all imagine is, for example, why are our roads 90 degrees? People on the incline, we don't walk in 90 degree angles. <laughs> it's just nice to look on paper. So it does that make sense how yeah. those are designed for people. Those are designed for something else. Yeah. yeah. Just cars. <laughs> but uh, if you even think of it in a systems way, uh, the spreading, let's, let's go back to movement of myths or misinformation. Uh, if you think of it in a systems way, is there a possibility to control this, to also be able to use what we've learned from how misinformation spreads to now spread the correct information, or uh, what do you think? It's a, it's a tricky area. I think here we have so many more questions than we have answers, but if we look at the recent response um, to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what was really interesting was that misinformation played um, had a different function in different uh, countries based on what the pre-existing levels of trust are that um, citizens, patients, communities have with their governments. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not necessarily a linear uh, relationship that in countries where um, the authorities are more trusted that the information that was coming from them uh, was um, was trusted mm -hmm. only because the situation was so so uncertain, mm -hmm. and in situations of, of uncertainty, you you are only working with the best information you have at that time, and so it's not necessarily a, a case of uh, intentionally um, misleading the people, but it's you're working with the evidence that you have. Sometimes that evidence is incomplete. Sometimes that evidence is wrong, mm -hmm. um, but you're making decisions based on, on, on what's at hand. So there is right now uh, a lot of research that's being done on how trust functions with misinformation. What are the pre-existing levels in, of, of, um, of trust in, in, a, in a society? And you know that's trust with authorities in democratic settings. That's trust in with authorities in non-democratic settings. But those relationships are not completely clear, mm -hmm. um, because you can have authoritarian uh, governments that are trusted by mm -hmm. the people. Um, so there's more research uh, happening there. But I would say that just on a systems level, what is interesting is is that there's a trickle up. There's an embeddedness of the system because, of course, uh, at an individual level, at a personal level. Because, as, as Livia has said, there's so much information. I mean, I, if I'm feeling unwell, I can Google as much as I need to and then go armed to my doctor and say, well, I think I have this and this and this. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, now, how much I listen to my doctor or not will depend on you know, do I trust my doctor's expertise? Do I trust that my doctor really will diagnose based not only on her expertise, but for her care for me? Um, but, but those relationships exist and sort of bubble up to what we see in the society. So I think that the work that needs to be done on misinformation and trust and how that relates to um, issues of, of people's sense of health and well-being, more work is being done on this and, and more work is needed, yeah. Mm. Do you think it's time for the next card? Maybe I can. Uh, I just or? have uh, you know a comment because uh -huh. myth does not stand for misinformation. Not always. So <laughs> you, myth can be celebrated a lot. Oh yeah, absolutely. But we could move to another card. <laughs> this is something we. But don't we can wish ideate on that if you want. Yeah. <laughs> well, mythos contrasts with logos ultimately, mm -hmm. but. Um, Logos itself seeks truth as aletheia, so it is truth that keeps on being veiled and unveiled, rather than always manifesting itself as that which is visible. So the mythical uh, is at the basis of worldviews that would have been articulated in the high literature, odes, traditions that are mm -hmm. narrations that would have informed communal life. And in a sense, uh, the, the mythical um, generates the possibilities of there being utopia. Mm -hmm. And utopia is important for mobilization, for of giving course. certain horizons, 
even if it doesn't match what we might take to be a fact. Mm. So if we're talking about information and data and link it to what we take to be a state of affairs that we can call it factual, even now the very fact that we are being recorded mm -hmm. uh, entails that we can comment on this event and return to what has been uttered and stated in it. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot that is concealed of the truth of the entirety of this event, which comes with each one of us having their, their own subjective perspective mm -hmm. onto it. And the entirety of our investment in it that is temporal, what came just before the event, what are the expectations as it is unfolding and mm. what comes afterwards. So the factual itself is open to the possibilities of being multiple, uh, mm -hmm. having multiple ways of interpreting it. And to turn it into information and data would be very suitable for what we are now driven towards, which is a form of cognition that is artificial, that is alg uh, algorithmic, and does it take into account what we bring as a baggage that holds the mythical within, within it, mm. through our emotions, memories, leanings, and the traditions that we carry, and sometimes in concealment without knowing that they impress on our thinking. But that it is very important to control for personal biases. For example, when mm. you're performing research, mm. you have to take into account that uh, you may be bringing a cultural background or uh, what your, just your expectations on it and always have different checkpoints where you can see if your biases are uh, affecting your results. Uh, so, of course, it is very important to recognize uh, that uh, myth and everything that we know and will ever know also is very personal and comes uh, from certain biases, maybe. That's very important. I think we have time for another card, so maybe I can ask you here to take the card. Ooh. Music. In terms of movement. Mm. <laughs> uh -huh. Very interesting. <laughs> you don't want me to sing, so we stop with that. <laughs> yeah. And I told you, you may have to dance, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, we spoke, uh, we had dinner last, last time with the staff of Stockholm Organics Forum, and we were talking about how music is the universal language. Mm -hmm. And interestingly as well, it reflects uh, and evolves through the movement of, of people. Ah, I got the link. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> One very interesting example is also I worked in Benin, and uh, Benin is known as a country of voodoo. And uh, interestingly, when uh, uh, during colonial times and during slavery, there were a large uh, portion of people m moving from uh, the Daomi Kingdom at the time uh, to Southern Africa, Southern America, sorry, uh, in Brazil. And there's a door there called La Porte de Noroto, the door of no return. It's a very emotional place to visit this, this, this place. And why I'm talking about this is because today, the voodoo religion, the voodoo festival is known to happen in Brazil and not in Benin. Mm. And it's quite interesting. And it's a very lively place. It's where, where it's, the culture is celebrated, mm. uh, music and so on. But uh, we asked at the, at the time the president there, but why, why is this? Why is this culture not celebrated there? Because it's mm. headquartered in Benin. And uh, there was the argument that there's not enough policy celebrating culture there in favor of development. And I think this is, this, we, need, we need to redefine the proper, the rightful place of culture mm. uh, to celebrate people, to celebrate their own history within, within communities. And this is usually a an unfortunate consequence of rapidly developing nations because we tend to forget that those soft elements, those soft, soft dimensions are what makes a culture a culture. And mm -hmm. in most places, uh, when we turn towards tourism studies, we, we see that people actually are more inclined to visit a place because of the history and the identity and the culture of the place rather than to visit high-tech and uh, contemporary buildings. And usually, 
what developing nations tend to do as well is disregard culture and, and music and, and dance and folk, folklore to, to build buildings that can now be seen everywhere. You can, you can take the building from Benin, you move it to Burkina Faso, you move it to Colombia, it's, there's no history with it. But I think those uh, policy now has to be ingrained mm -hmm. within territories. And when we talk about the global south, those places are beautiful to visit. For example, in For Benin, sure. I went, Benin is one of the poorest countries in the world, but it's also one of my favorite because culturally it thrives. Wherever you go, you see those art pe uh, people still celebrate their own, their own identity. Uh, you go through the streets, people are, 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 are still living in the way that adheres to their old tribal uh, principles. And also, interestingly, when talking about music and, uh, and, and cities, I visited a place in Colombia called Comuna 13, which is a slum. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very, and in Medellin, in Medellin at the time, which was under the rule of Pablo Escobar, the drug lord, there was a lot of violence in the city and was one of the most dangerous cities in the world. But today, it's one of the most livable. Mm -hmm. And what the mayor at the time did was incredible because he built a cable car at the cost of the city to access those favelas, to bring people uh, access to job and to regenerate those areas. But today, people, tourists, pay to visit the favelas because the favelas thrive. When you go there, the graffiti is on the wall, cultural manifestations, music mm. in the slums, and it creates a whole new economy for those communities. And it's actually incredible that through the power of music, they regenerated a whole slum. And mm -hmm. this, usually, we don't have been the original instinct of an urban planner. The no. first instinct to build, but mm. here, it was, it was music. Yeah, it was music. <laughs> That's perfect. Mm. Who would like to build up on that? I feel like maybe you already have ideas. <laughs> wow. I'll just very quickly speak and um, just pick up on the ideas of, of, of movement through time and, and how music does that. Um, because when we started this this morning, we had the, the wonderful musicians. Mm -hmm. And so I was asking Britta um, just to tell me a little bit about the folk music. Um, and so she was explaining it to me and, and she said, you know, it has a bit of a sorrowful sound to it, a bit of a, of a lament. And my response was, well, I can, under, I can hear it, but I understand that, you know, this, it, maybe it was written in the winter. Like maybe, it was, maybe this is music that was composed in the, in the Swedish winter, but I was, I was transported having never uh, experienced a Swedish winter, having never mm. experienced one, you know, hundreds of years ago. But the sound of the music actually took me there mm. and I could imagine what it would be like um, in the darkness, in the cold, but to have this uh, beautiful lamenting sound and so the power of, of music is that it, it it can spark not only our imaginations just that prof made, made the point earlier about you know time temporality and spatial spatiality um, but but music is a very powerful force not just to move us into the future but also into the past mm -hmm. and allows us to um, connect with ideas and peoples that we would never experience otherwise and mm -hmm. There's probably no other force on the planet that can do that. How fitting we are in the music, uh, <laughs> in the music uh, college in Stockholm and talking about the importance of music and how it can actually move you. And yes, and I can also think of how music can evoke certain emotions and then uh, help, for example, people fight for new things and um, build new ideas and... Uh, be repeated by others. Uh, we we all know uh, songs that have been used in revolutions, and we, throughout the years we still connect to them and feel. Maybe we don't even know the language, uh, but we know the message they're trying to portray. Uh, so that's very important. Mm. Uh, it's only two minutes. We have either time for a very very fast new card. I actually or? would like to catch up on exactly. We can continue <laughs> I think this catching is a really up. Cool topic. <laughs> I think um, I think what you said about tra tradition and and also what you said about music bringing us to like places. I think this is so really interesting. And I wonder, like, when we when we then design, we spoke also about designing cities, and then no one visits them, or no one would visit a city before technology. And I wonder if if we're leaving sort of this part of um, of us in a way behind. Like we're moving forward through, with technology. And we're improving so many things. 
that are sort of convenient and efficient through technology, but then this part that is the creativity and, and, and sort of this relationship to our emotions, that one not so much. And I wonder, I wonder where, where that, whether we're leaving something behind while we're moving elsewhere. On the other hand, I mean, this is maybe a bit out there, but there are, for example, there's artificial intelligence that now has been started to be trained to develop um, art. So there is one, for example, that develops actually quite interesting artworks that are visual, and I'm, I'm sure also it exists in the, in the musical domain. And I wonder if there, is, if there could be ever something that we as humans could relate to. This is maybe a bit very futuristic now, but I wonder if, if, if technology could also, in a way, maybe... It, it doesn't have to be sort of maybe this sort of just functional thing, but could also maybe help us then connect back to our to these kinds of roots almost and, and these emotions. Mm. And that's very interesting because there are actually artificial intelligence that can write poetry as well. So it relates to our inner feelings and mm. yeah, this is very true. Mm. I just wonder what we think of this. <laughs> Whether anyone would really think this is art if it's uh, done by a machine. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's already demos of that, and they sound quite eerie. <laughs> to, to me, they sound in, not human, so I, I'm painfully aware of the mm. <laughs> existence of a computer. So mm. uh, it evokes actually, I'd say, negative emotions. Mm. So it, it will be interesting to see how we can, and if we can, mm. uh, make it uh, evoke positive emotions mm. in people. We will see. Um, I was actually wrong. We have 10 more minutes. Uh, so we have uh, time for another card, maybe from Aku. Yes. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> maps. <laughs> so the final word is on maps. Exactly. Very interesting. Um, hmm. So if I may uh, share a personal reflection thinking about movement. Um, I mean, so I, I come from Ghana, but you can tell from my accent that I've moved around quite a bit. Um, but I think about my grandmother, who was actually Nigerian, and she met my grandfather along the way and moved and, and lived her adult life in Accra. So I grew up with a, with a Nigerian grandmother um, in yeah, culture and food and, and her way of being. But it wasn't until I was much older that I actually learned that her father actually had come from Sierra Leone mm -hmm. and that her um, mother was actually from Brazil, oh, wow. that she was one of the uh, returnees, um, sort of second half of the uh, 19th century, freed slaves who had migrated back from Brazil to Lagos at that time um, because they thought that there was a better life for them, for them there. And so just on this idea of movement, um, you know, we, many of us move, we, we, we travel through maps, mm. we end up in different maps, we move for different reasons, and, um, and that that movement is longer than uh, we think it is. So I've moved a lot in my life, and, um, but I, when I look at the people in my family, I see that there's been movement uh, for a long time, and so I think mm. that... Um, when we think about migration, we just have to consider that, that people move for all kinds of reasons and that, that migration is sometimes longer than we, we think it is. And, you know, mm -hmm. people migrate through generations. Um, so for me, when I think of maps, I, I have a very personal connection mm. to um, maps and what they mean and, and sort of the, the movement of peoples. Mm. Yeah, this is interesting because, that you brought up your grandma because I also have a very strong uh, memory of my grandmother connecting to maps. Uh, and it was pretty recently, I was talking, I'm from Greece, and uh, I was talking with my grandma and I was mentioning something about Sweden, where I live. And she said, can you show me Sweden on the map? Uh, because she comes from a small village in Greece. And I took out my phone, and you know, first it shows the location you're in, and then I zoomed out to come to Sweden, and she immediately responded with, is Greece that small? It was the first time in her life that she had seen how small the place where she lives is. And I told her, yeah, Greece is a very small country. And uh, she said, for me, moving from the village to the next big city has been the work of a lifetime. And you have moved across the world, and you think this is uh, something that's not important. So yeah, movement of people. 
and also the perspective that they can, that this movement can bring and how our perspective in what is a large movement has changed mm. within just the, a couple generations mm. uh, is incredible. Would you like yeah. something to add? Um, yes, but I'm That's very interesting <laughs> as well because when I was thinking of maps I, and, and listening to you, Aku, uh, it's very interesting because today we have a service, uh, 23 and Me, the like heritage, where you can do mm -hmm. a, a test and it gives you a map of your heritage. You know, your 8% uh, yes. Indonesian or 3% mm. uh, from Mauritius and, and so on. And you can, through, you can see those lineage through time. And it's, it's very, very interesting. It offers a new perspective on, on our history and identity. And also, talking about maps, we can go back to history. Uh, talking about maps and power. For example, in mm -hmm. the 14th century, how China invested um, heavily mm -hmm. in mapping, in, 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 cartographing the, mm -hmm. in cartographing the world. Yeah. And it shows how uh, conquest for, for new places were priority in the political economy of the time. Mm -hmm. And also, inter interestingly, talking about uh, this for movement, it was not only to, to access resources and to, mm -hmm. to move products and goods to other parts of the world, to establish new ties, but also in doing so, they kind of, uh, not polluted, but uh, create a merge of, of uh, different cultures and disciplines, introduce rats and mm -hmm. other, uh, other animals in different parts of the world. Interestingly, also talking about movement and maps, we know of many scientific expeditions in the past mm -hmm. uh, yes. that led to not only discovering new lands, but uh, establishing new landmarks, for example, how it was important to map out the height of specific mountains mm -hmm. and how it, it, yes, it, it was a movement of, of science that allowed mm -hmm. to do this. But also in contemporary, more interestingly for, for me, it's contemporary movement in maps. Now it, there's not much left to discover around the world. We all know the territories uh, pretty much, but now we see a new wave of uh, space colonization and a new wave of space technology that provides us all the ability to see the world around us. We all have Google Maps on our phone, mm -hmm. Google Earth. And in, in, in my very field, cities and communities, every day when we have a new site, we just go on Google Maps because it's so, it's so easy and so precise. Mm. And this precision is offering a new wave Absolutely. of, of uh, technological development. And interestingly, this was very much a contribution of of uh, investment in, mm -hmm. into uh, science and space technology. Absolutely. So the whole perspective of cartography is very much a legacy mm -hmm. of the space movement. Absolutely. Mm. I guess so, I mean, when maps in general, I think they are so, so relative in a way, no? Like, I mean, when we think throughout history, it has changed so often. And I'm, for example, from Slovakia originally, and when I was born, it was part of the Soviet Union, and then I came to Austria with my parents as refugees from mm -hmm. this system. And then, now, when I talk about Slovakia, it's part of the European Union. Yeah. And it's really then kind of tricky to describe to someone, like I lived in the US for a while, and I had to describe where I'm from, and they'd say, like, oh yeah, it's part of Europe. And, well, actually, it used to not be. <laughs> yes. And it's kind of, I think this is also, it shows how... I guess Europe is one example, but also mm. other countries you mentioned in Africa, how, how borders are and, and maps are kind of, they're so relative and artificial in a way. Mm. We change them all the time. And I wonder how in the future, whether what we think now is a country and there's Sweden and there's yes. uh, Greece, but maybe in, in like 20 years even or further down, it will be again looking very different. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have the last words? <laughs> on maps? <laughs> yes, on maps. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I see, uh, you know, in the, the process behind cartography and, and mapping, a uh, spatial kind of drive in terms of exploration uh, that ultimately allows for a greater capacity to uh, encircle and frame a given territory. And uh, this brings uh, uh, lots of disciplines to bear on the way maps themselves have, have evolved uh, in terms of investment and all kinds of research that could feed into it. And even before reaching uh, the moon from the 17th century, there was even the attempt to understand 
uh, the moon through its visible uh, surface by using uh, astronomy as a means of observation to map mm -hmm. it. And the fact that now we are heading into uh, potential uh, th thought, at, at least maybe mythical, mm -hmm. of um, finding another dwelling place rather mm -hmm. than Earth. Um, as a way also of perhaps thinking about uh, an Earth that in the future might not be properly inhabitable. Mm. So the mapping is a mode of conquest also. Mm. Thank you so much for this talk today. It has been amazing. I have learned a lot. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Uh, thank you very much for joining us at home and on the site. Um, thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.